and welcome to today's show. I'm here with uh, Nathan Schneider, or Professor Nathan Schneider, because I think uh, you currently teach media studies, right, at um, University of Boulder, Colorado. I hope I've got that correct. University of Colorado, Boulder. Colorado, Bo Boulder, sorry. Yeah, because <laughs> I'm not I'm not a Native American. I don't, um, you know, like all the locations and things are kind of strange to me in the word orderings. Um, but I'm interviewing you about something slightly different today, which is your book, God in Proof, which was published actually quite a few years ago now. Um, and it, it's a book about, I suppose, your personal religious journey kind of mixed in with a quest for a sort of proof of God's existence. And you, co you comment on kind of social aspects of religion and the proof industry as well. Um, so my first question for you is just going to be what prompted you to write the book, God in Proof? Yeah, well, uh, first of all, thank you for digging it up. Uh, you know, it's a an important book for me, you know, still still is, but not one that I get to I get to chat about very much. And and um, so I apologize if I'm a bit rusty, but I really appreciate that opportunity. Um, oh, it's okay, don't worry. <laughs> uh, but you know what? It was a very personal prompt, really. Um, initially, was I I was in the midst of my own conversion and was trying to figure out what that meant. Um, I felt, you know, the the way it worked for me is the calling and the draw um, kind of worked ahead of my own comprehension of what was going on. Um, I, I, I became a, a Christian and a Roman Catholic when I was 18. Um, and uh, I was a, just starting uh, at, at university at that time. And, uh, and, and I, but I did not you know, I was not comfortable with what was going on. It was an uncomfortable process. It was a process that I didn't really understand. And um, trying to figure out how much I could understand um, what people had understood in the past uh, about the existence of God, about um, what reason can demonstrate, um, you know, continued to be uh, a, a question for me, not just an intellectual question, though it is intellectually fascinating in all sorts of way, but ways, but it was also a question that was keeping me up at night. And at the same time, too, that was a period um, in the early 2000s when religion and questions about the existence of God were like very much in the public square. You know, you had a, a, a very kind of um, uh, a, a very religiously oriented presidential administration in the United States, driving controversial, kind of heartbreaking things like the war in Iraq. Um, and you had these prominent new atheists who were making a lot of um, uh, headlines about their kind of very strident, um, you know, uh, anti-religious positions and also just like arguments against the existence of God. So this, this debate about God was not just personal, it was also very political in that in that period and it was that intersection that i was really interested in exploring yeah it was interesting for me to read because the book is obviously written at a time that's like i, I mean i'm 25 now but so most of my engagement i mean maybe when i was a teenager that was kind of the landscape but most of my engagement i suppose intellectually has been you know very very much after that kind of landscape has dissolved people don't really think too much about you know like the Hitchens and Dawkins and Harris's so more in my generation it's very very different kind of people that talk about these things so it, yeah it was interesting to to read your book and we can talk a bit later about um you know your engagement with some of these people like Alvin Plantinga his retirement party and stuff um but the first question I've got then about your sort of personal journey in the book is what drew you to religion in the first place then so um i suppose the easy theological answer would be god's grace or something but um yeah and what you, you know in, t in terms of the the specific kind of um historical causes there I'll, I'll always use that answer um but but also you know there's a kind of biographical um piece of it too which is just you know i i grew up with a with an interesting kind of complex religious uh, 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 experience from the Judaism of my father's side to, um, you know, being taught Christian prayers by my mother uh, as a kid, but then at the same time watching her get um, drawn into a very powerful, beautiful path um, uh, uh, as a uh, ultimately a, a follower of a, of a uh, Indian guru named Ramana Maharshi, and, and um, you know, and and so this kind of complex mix of, of things that I encountered growing up. And then it was ultimately um, actually through both of them that I um, I ended up 
uh, uh, spending some time, you know, in the middle of a, a hard period when when they were actually splitting up, uh, in um, uh, staying at a, a Catholic monastery in in Virginia um, called Holy Cross Abbey, and the the monks very kind of uh, kind of shockingly in some respects let me really share their life with them for a few weeks, and that was the beginning um, for me where. Um, you know, again, it did not feel easy. It did not feel, uh, this still felt very foreign, but it felt like something I could not say, say no to, um, starting at that point. And, um, and I, it, there was kind of no turning back. Um, the, the calling just became really entrenched, um, in that experience, even if, again, there were so many unanswered questions. Um, uh, but that, that, you know, it was really that monastic experience that, that, uh, experience of being among, surrounded by people who had committed their lives so deeply to this, um, to this path, um, that that you know, compelled me to to ask, what is my path? Where am I in relation to this? And it, it seems like at this stage in your journey, I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, but proofs really weren't playing that much of a role. Um, you know, kind of it, more the experiential side, right? Of um what you know we're working through whatever you were going through personally and then maybe finding like peace in the monastery and stuff and that, that the way that that linked together is what it feel it, at least i i get the sense that that's what drew you in the book i mean you talk about some conversations that you had mm -hmm. um with, with a friend as well about these sorts of things that are going on but i mean is that is that right that it's it's primarily you know not the proofs that are like playing playing this role in your kind of um conversion experience or if that's the right way of calling it well yes and no i mean of course the draw, you know, was so it was emotional, you know, biographical, all these things. But at the same time, you know, the, the there was also something very precious and even sacred about the rational um, for me at, at that point. You know, that that during that period, for instance, I jumped into well, my first semester in college. I took a course in advanced deductive logic, which I should not have. I should have waited a little longer. Um, but I was. Um, you know, the, the, there was something kind of magical about that about that um, way of thinking, that possibility of of knowing something beyond beyond not even a reasonable doubt, but for sure. Um, and you know, the course, of course, ended with um, this this famous um, incompleteness theorem of of Kurt Gödel, um, great logician of the twentieth century, um, and um, and and it poses this paradox on the one hand the, this this work of incredible mathematical and, and rational reasoning but this 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 achievement that also demonstrates this kind of um incompleteness of a logical system and and that you know always you know that paradox you know is something i was wrestling with throughout is is you know on the one hand the sense that we can achieve a remarkable things through rational thought but at the same time the further you take rational thought the more you recognize oh actually there are profound limits to this and and it was that that paradox throughout that um i was wrestling with you know i i'm the sort of person who does not you know <laughs> separate the emotional and 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 lived experience from the rational you know i i um you know i'm a i'm a, a kind of you know, li live in libraries, love to um, lo love to understand, you know, deeply whatever is is drawing me, and and um, and and so it, it it was impossible to separate the two, and and even in the monastery, you know, the whole time I was there, at that point, I was just reading, 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 and and I had a um, you know monk in particular who's just feeding me these incredible um, you know ancient mystical texts, um, and uh, and and the um you know so the rational side was always there it was how i was processing um what what was happening um in me spiritually and emotionally and and beyond so in the book you sort of describe becoming a catholic and your your specific you know you specifically being baptized into the catholic church at easter which is what what happens in catholicism sort of every year um but you also describe at the time you know the I, I don't want to put word in your mouth, but that, you know, you weren't kind of fully sold uh, on on the whole thing, you know, right there. And almost like maybe a sense of deflation after the experience that it was like, well, you know, th then you just kind of left and life continues as normal. Do you, want, do you want to just speak a little bit to, you know, that that experience of being baptized into the church and um, how you kind of process that whole thing? 
Yeah, I, I, at that time, I didn't feel like I had a choice. You know, I felt like I, I you know, not because anybody coerced me. I mean, at, it, to the contrary, everybody around me was was more likely to ask, what are you doing and why? What, you know, are you okay, <laughs> right? Um, nobody was compelling me, but I felt this kind of um, uh, inescapable um, call. But at the same time, it really took about 10 years for me to feel comfortable in that call for me to be able to say, you know, I'm a Christian, I'm a Catholic without kind of internally cringing in some way, <laughs> like, am I really? Um, and, and that's just, that's, that's the path God had for me, right? That's the path I, I, I needed to follow in some, in some respects, others have a different way, have a different experience. Um, you know, I tend to see sometimes like other, a lot of other Catholic converts these days, you know, are people with like this incredible sense of like almost excessive certainty. Um, I did not have that problem. <laughs> um, you know, I, I had to really wrestle with it. Um, and I'm grateful I did, you know, I, I, you know, I can't, it was a, it was a period that I worked through and, and that I came to another side of, um, there's always more to work through, but, um, but that that constant self questioning is not something I I you know I experienced in the same way as I did then. But um, it was that that place of constant self questioning that um, you know compelled me to do something as absurd as try to write a history of um, you know of the the quest to prove the existence of God um, because I just needed to know all of the proofs. You know I needed all of them. I needed everything I could get. Um, and so it was that that uncertainty that you know that that compelled me into a um, you know into into an otherwise absurd task um, that you know that 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 wound up in this book. Um, did any of the proofs you know solve that problem for me? Did did writing the book solve that problem for me? Uh, not really. Um, you know, in in many respects, it was other things. It was it was just. Um, it was much more, you know, just experientially, you know, coming into contact with people, you know, I, I experienced as saints, as, as uh, people who were deeply, um, uh, uh, deeply ex living the, the kind of poverty of the gospel and, uh, and, and its grace that, uh, that, you know, that, that showed me what this is really about and show and, and, um, you know, resolved some of these questions um, uh, for me, not intellectually, but just made them change form. Uh, at the same time, uh, that, you know, that that drive that that made me write this book is something that I'm grateful for, right? Because it, it uh, uh, you know, took me on a journey. So you, um, as, as you kind of alluded to when you talked about this deductive logic uh, module, you went and kind of studied religion formally. And I'm wondering, you know, how did that kind of change your views of your personal faith? Because I, I know a lot of people who either um, go to like seminary as part of some Christian denomination, or they, you know, they go to like a secular university and study philosophy or New Testament history or something. And it kind of, you know, it, it, the provision of more information just changes the way they understand their personal faith. For some people that leads to deconversion, for other people it leads to kind of like a modified um, mm -hmm. understanding of the religion that they continue to participate in. Um, and I was wondering, you know, so so how did this kind of academic study um, intersect with your own faith, faith and kind of um, influence the way that you looked at those experiences that you previously had and so forth? Yeah, um, it, it was it was an important part of it. Um, I, you know, my first major was computer science. Um, so I, again, I kind of went hard on the rational side first. And then, you know, I realized, okay, I could do this, I could like pass these classes, but, um, you know, I wasn't doing well in it, you know, and, um, uh, and, I, you know, it's still very much a part of, you know, what I do now. Um, I'm grateful I did that. But, um, but then I, you know, I ended up um, really doubling down and focusing on religion, which was wonderful. Um, uh, but it was it was a secular program. It was a place that generally um, lots of people end up going um, because they're in some way alienated from their um, from their tradition. And so, in a in a sense, I was an outlier. There was you know maybe one professor who you know I could really share a sense of faith with with a closed door, and you know um, you know it was not it was not part of what that department was about is at a secular university. Um, and in a way I felt more comfortable with that because of my own upbringing. 
Um, I didn't feel like I could assume, you know, a Catholic context, for instance, I didn't really want to go to a Catholic school. I, I felt like I was, I was better suited at a place where, you know, where, where many traditions were present. Um, but at the same time, there was sometimes an excessive uh, skepticism, uh, both in, you know, in, in undergrad, and then I went to graduate school for religious studies. Um, you know, there was often this message that like, the people who take, for instance, arguments about the existence of God seriously, you know, are, you know, th that was resolved years ago, and they're all dumb. Um, and, uh, and then more and more, I started looking outside of what I was being offered in those contexts and, um, and started realizing, I, actually, a lot of the things that people in that kind of secular religious studies world were dismissing around arguments, you know, about the existence of God were, you know, were, were more compelling than, than they were giving credit to. Um, that there was, even in the present, as well as in the past, you know, really live and fascinating debates about what these arguments meant and what they could represent and what they could teach us. Um, and so that discovery of this kind of living tradition um, was in some respects counter to what I was being taught in school. At the same time, there was one really important piece that really made the book come together for me, which was, uh, you know, my last semester in graduate school, um, I, I, uh, delved into the, um, a book about the, the proofs that was written at the end of the life of um, uh, Hegel, a, you know, canonical German philosopher, right, the 19th century. Um, and in this, he, he articulated the historical proofs that had come before him as a historical sequence. So um, rather than treating them as discrete, as separate, arguments, one of which might be correct, um, instead sees them as, as different views, as, as, as a course of evolution, uh, a process of understanding through very different lenses, um, uh, a, um, uh, a, a, and as actually part of, of an ongoing relationship between human beings and God. And that, that way of seeing the proofs as actually connected rather than being these kind of discrete events was really eye-opening for me and, and became in some respects, the philosophical basis of the book, this recognition that, that these arguments are not just what they say they are, that they're actually part of a bigger story. And it was that bigger story that I tried to, uh, tried to tell in the book. And, and that I think is in some respects, you know, and it, um, it enabled me to make some original contribution there to, to, to um, put, you know, that kind of core insight of, of Hegel into, um, into a narrative and, um, and to reread those arguments um, in their historical context um, through that lens, through that recognition that these are, these are part of something bigger. Yeah, I think something that you touch on in the book, which I've observed is that people who were sort of maybe educated or interested in philosophy or educated in it around 10, 15, 20 years ago, maybe, um, they sort of see the pro project of natural theology or kind of theistic proofs as just being done away with like, well, you know, the problem of evil, that just does away with all that. Or um, And it's it's interesting if, when you listen to the most sort of competent um, naturalist or atheist philosophers now, so people like Graham Oppie, for example, that, you know, they really do take seriously what people like Alexander Proust have to say about Thomism or what people like Ed, I mean, they don't agree with it, of course, but, you know, they see they see it as like a serious um, thing to be engaged, like not just something that's been kind of done away with and left in the past. Like, um, and, and even I think like Oppie's views on modality and causation stuff have been really influenced by the kind of Thomistic view as well. Um, and that's something that you see come through in your book as well. Um, I wanted to ask about as well, your experiences as a writer, I think this is after university, where you, you talked about kind of going around some places in the in the Middle East or, or, or Turkey and engaging with sort of like Islamic apologetics. Um, and, you talk, and I think it was intelligent design that was the sort of specific big thing at the time. So now I think this has kind of died out a bit, but at the time this, this was quite big, the, the sort of um, attempts um, to specify what design might mean, you know, in this specific way, and then maybe kind of scientifically talk about how certain things would sign. I mean, maybe to preface all this, so what, what were you doing as a writer of religion um, that kind of led you over to, to, I think it was Turkey in the book, um, but it might, I might be wrong about that. 
No, that that's right. Um, you know, I, I had been exploring this in my uh, on my academic side too. I had done a th there was a big debate. Um, I think it was like a, or a, a trial. Excuse me. Uh, I think it was like two thousand five. Um, uh, around then, uh, uh, it was you know during my last year in in college. So I did my college thesis on this debate or this this trial about intelligent design in Pennsylvania. And I uh, you know this was intelligent design was this attempt to kind of re brand creationism in the context of like particular kind of scientific statements about where God might have been in the development of life. Um, and um, and it was it was put together by this like very clever marketing campaign, this sort of thing. Um, and the um, you know what I became fascinated with in that in looking at that trial was the way in which this debate was not really just about intelligent design. It was not about the specific scientific claims, there was a performance at work here. And it was a, it, you could not understand what was going on in Pennsylvania there without understanding the history that had led to it and the stage that had been set before it. Same reason, you know, same way you can't understand why, you know, the great kind of political populist of the Democratic Party, William Jennings Bryan, um, was the one who stepped up to defend creationism in the, the Scopes trial in the 1920s, right? This was, this was, integrally connected with, you know, his role as a populist politician uh, 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 fighting the gold standard, right? I mean, it, it, it's a um, it, it's a historical thing. And, and one way to understand that historical specificity was to go to a different context. And the, um, you know, I was fascinated by this, um, this figure who was known as still sort of as uh, uh, Harun Yahya in, in Turkey. Um, who was the kind of lone leading um, creationist figure in the in the Muslim world, and he had some links also with the U.S. intelligent design community. And um, what was striking was that whereas in the U.S. at that time, you know, creationism and intelligent design was like this live wire that was highly controversial, um, and lots of people were getting activated about it. In the Middle East, people kind of didn't care. Um, Yahya wasn't just trying to advance this campaign. He was trying to get people to care about this whole question to begin with. And that made me, you know, recognize that this, you know, so many of these debates cannot be understood without, you know, the historical precedence, you know, that that in the Middle East, you know, I, I went to a department of biology, asked different professors in, in Jordan, you know, what they thought about creationism versus, you know, evolution, whatever. And the, you know, they they all had their personal opinions, but they never talked about it. You know, it had just had not really come up because in in the Middle East, there just had not been the same history of of anxiety about this topic as, for instance, in the Anglophone world, where we had, you know, um, this this very, very strong movement of, you know, as you put it, natural theology. Um, uh, uh, that had to do with like the economics of being a past of being a scientist in early 19th century Britain that like to be a scientist, you either had to be an aristocrat or you had to be a, a pastor. And so there was this strong incentive for linking scientific activity with um, with religious activity to the point that they kind of overstepped it, got over their skis. Darwin comes out, challenges that whole model, challenges that way of understanding the world. Um, becomes highly controversial, um, you know, of people other than Darwin, you know, step up um, the, the debate, it becomes this thing, it becomes this, this controversy, whereas, you know, for instance, centuries earlier, St. Augustine, um, you know, warned in the confessions in the last chapter of the confessions, like, um, do not take the book of Genesis, literally, you will get yourselves in trouble, <laughs> right? Um, so it didn't have to become a thing. Um, and that was again, you know, such an important piece for me in 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 constructing the book is is being able to insist that you know as as powerful and and interesting as any argument about the existence of God is in isolation on its own terms, we have to understand it in a historical context, and that the choices being made, the the types of strategies being used. The, the motivation for these arguments is always grounded in the life of the people doing it and in the histories that they inherit. And that if we detach the arguments from those things, we are missing something not only intellectually interesting, but actually maybe spiritually interesting. Maybe we're missing 
um, some of the deep truth that is actually um, possible to find in these arguments if we treat them just as logical artifacts. Yeah, that it, it sounds like there's a deep kind of influence from from um, what you read in Hegel that are kind of coming through in your own approach, right? Where you're, you know, you're kind of looking at, at the way uh, the, the ideas worked itself out through time, as it were, and looking at, at all those things. I think, um, I, I don't know. I don't know if this, is, this isn't a question I pre-planned, so this might be a little bit off topic, but it, it seems to me that in, in the a lot of the contemporary um, sort of debate that people maybe on both sides want to overlook some of those historical details because the idea wants the idea that some people are kind of putting forward is well you know like re reason is reason or truth is truth and so I, I don't really I, you know I, I, I want to remove the argument from any of these kind of historically contingent um, facts and just talk about you know propositions that are, you know that are truth out to something and um it, you know this rhetoric even comes from the religious side sometimes because it's like, well, well, look, I just want, you know, I just, it, it's the true propositions that demonstrate, you know, they conclude God exists. It follows logically and inescapably. I mean, maybe, maybe we can talk about this a bit more as it comes through um, from the kind of apologetics industry that you talk about visiting um, and how they view arguments as opposed to this kind of maybe more nuanced way of, of looking at things that kind of you, you went about. But I, I, before we kind of move on from the intelligent design stuff that you, you talked about, was it a zookeeper who you talked to who um you know hadn't heard of evolution before and you kind of told him about evolution and then he came back the next day and had something to say could you just briefly kind of tell people that that kind of story and interaction that you'd had when you when i think you're asking him is um evolution compatible with uh, islam yeah um you know it was just it was just one of many um encounters uh, you know this was in jordan um and you know it's just striking how much raising a question that at that time in the United States was a major public question and that, you know, anybody reading the, the news had to have an opinion on, um, that just was not a question. And that here was somebody who, you know, who, who, you know, had to think about it a little while and then came back with a conclusion the next day, um, you know, and a, and a kind of, a, a kind of ad hoc argument that, that he had, come up with about, you know, well, I, I draw the line at humans, right? Um, uh, and, and it's, you know, any of us would do that about something that, you know, an interesting question that we just had never really thought about before. And it was the fact that it was, you know, it was a kind of original thought, you know, question for him that struck me that he didn't have a pat answer, like anyone who, you know, might go to a, you know, a mega church in the United States at that time might have. Um, but, but, you know, on that, that point about detaching, I, I do think it's true that a lot of, um, uh, particularly in the proof industry, I saw both on the atheist side and the kind of, uh, and the kind of apologetic side, um, uh, in the, in the U S I was seeing a, a, a deep interest in trying to, to reach truth with a capital T. And the, the idea that there was just no patience for the sense that, oh, these are historically interesting. Um, and, and you ended up with some pretty weird stuff. You know, you mentioned Thomism earlier, you know, uh, St. Thomas Aquinas. You, you would end up seeing people either using or challenging Thomistic arguments about the existence of God in, in a way that's interesting because they... Um, they were you leveraging these arguments to advance the claim that God exists. And in some respects, they're useful for that. And if you read his chapters on the existence of God, you know, it does seem like they do that work. But if you read them in light of his, where he was and what he was trying to do in his career and what he was, you know, risking his life to do, for instance, because people were getting killed for doing things like, like what he was doing, um, you know, you recognize what he was really what was most front of mind for him was not proving the existence of God. That was uncontroversial in his world. Um, what he was interested in was synthesizing, you know, the arguments from around the Mediterranean. That was the real hard job that he understood himself as doing was, was making classical knowledge and, and, and Islamic knowledge and Jewish knowledge safe for Christians. Um, his arguments resemble profoundly 
you know, the arguments of, of Maimonides, the Jewish philosopher, who in turn drew arguments from the, the Muslim world in which he lived. Um, you know, uh, Thomas was reading both of them. So, so it's, you, you are reading him profoundly out of context and, and, and missing what was important to him when you, when you simply try to apply, you know, those arguments to the context of, you know, the early 21st century and, you know, argue with new atheists with them. That was not what he was doing. And you miss something profound about what he was doing, you know, when you, when you um, take that, that ahistorical approach. And, and actually, the more I realized that, when I read Thomas alongside Maimonides, that was spiritually very profound for me because, it, you know, in some ways it was more profound than the arguments themselves. The recognition of what he was risking, you know, you know, people around him getting burned at the stake for doing similar things. Um, uh, and that he was trying to s synthesize this conversation among traditions across the Mediterranean at that time. That to me is a spiritually profound thing, um, a, a spiritually profound uh, uh, quest. And, and, and you, you miss that. And almost every account of Thomistic arguments that you see misses that, that the, 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 that you see written in the last century, misses what he was actually trying to accomplish there. That, that's interesting. I, I think it's sort of the idea of that truth with a capital T being um, kind of weaponized by both sides in the sense of you can kind of say, well, look, I, I, I'm just concerned with truth and these arguments or whatever. And it, it, it rhetorically does a lot of work then because it seems like you're, you know, you're the objective one or whatever. And I, I see, um, you know, atheists do this, but they, they tend to take like a weird kind of almost like Randian objectivism about reality and reading a book. Um, by a guy called Stephen Hicks or, or called Postmodernism Explained, which is just, you know, it, it, it makes these bizarre historical claims about um, like Kant and Hume being anti-enlightenment thinkers and, you know, the pre, pre people being like pre-rational before um, the enlightenment and, you know, no engagement with thinkers like Plato or Ar all, all, all the kind of nuance that exists. Um, but the, the point is that, you know, this idea of well, I'm just concerned with truth, and that leads me to, you know, like secularism, science, and so forth. That's one side of it, uh, and then the other side of it is um, the kind of religious approach of saying, well, look, I'm just concerned with proof. I've got what, what, which of the premises in my 27 premise, you know, neo Aristotelian argument for God's existence, do you object to? Um, and uh, and yeah, I, th I think what you're describing, maybe fr from the point of view uh, of a religious person, is that instead searching for God becomes this kind of murky synthesis of engagement with like you know with historical figures and with um trying trying to trying to understand things and bring all this stuff together not like this kind of you know there's just some some set of propositions that you have to discover but it's actually like a a, a boggy intellectual task that it means like get you know you have to get to know the thought world of these different times and bring, bring, translate that into your time and stuff so it's interesting um hearing you talk about that so you talk about going to California as well. You've kind of got a map with where you go to like Ray Comfort, um, Living Water Ministries, and then you go down to um, Biola, Biola, um, and then you went somewhere else. Um, so, so first off, like, wh why were you doing this in the first place? And then can you kind of talk about, you know, how how this um, apologetics world, or you call it the proof industry, I think is the chapter in the book, how that kind of differed from your previous engagements with um, proofs for God's existence. Well, it was really helpful to 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 see the kind of economics and you know the business of of proof that had evolved at at, at that time, um, where the people who were um, you know the kind of eminent figures arguing you, you know in this case largely uh, on behalf of the existence of God. Though, for instance, I also you know had a meeting with Sam Harris there um, during that trip. Um, you know, it, it was important to see, you know, the worlds in which they immersed themselves to, to, to recognize that these were part of, you know, they were part of a business model. They were part of a broader picture. They were part of a, a, a world of disciples, um, uh, a, a personal style, um, and, 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 and also just a kind of a part of, um, you know, that, that kind of deeply Californian, uh, uh, you know, uh, uh, a life world, you know, that, that these things were mixed up among like the, the TV studios and the, 
um, you know, this is part of, you know, the, the, the rest of, of the kind of Californian picture. Um, and and part of a, a history, you know, that Biola was was you know located ended up becoming located in in the town that was like the first planned community in the U.S. You know that that this stuff was not was inextricable from other elements of of American culture, um, and that they were kind of being made manifest um, uh, together. It, it was just also so important to see um, to see the um, the kind of interpersonal um, world of some of these figures, someone like William Lane Craig, for instance, a, a very prominent debater. You know, I spent time, I attended his uh, a summer class he teaches uh, for master's students there. And, and, and it was so important to see not only how he works in a day-to-day -day way, you know, very interesting, you know, life he leads as someone with a disability, you know, as somebody who, um, you know, has, has built this kind of personal, um, brand and empire, um, but also to see the, to get to know the students, you know, I, I, I stayed, you know, on the couch of one of his students and, and got to know a number of them and, you know, got to explore what role it was playing in their lives, um, and, and how they were starting to build their little, you know, brands, their personal brands, starting to, you know, market and build social media presence and, and recognize, okay, these are the choices you have to make in order to be part of the broader industry. You know, here are the lines you can't cross, here are the lines you can cross, you know, to recognize that this is an organizational thing. Biola, you know, was, you know, is a, is a, is an institution that is, you know, intellectually quite remarkable in many respects. It's also rooted in, in the, um, you know, the same money that created the fund fundamentalist movement in the United States. It has clear lines, um, things that you have to, um, you have to assent to, to teach there. Um, and, you know, I, I had conversations with professors there who wrestle and struggle, you know, with some of those lines that they have to hold. So seeing that broader picture about what kinds of alignments do people have to find themselves in to, to inhabit these worlds, to have these platforms, was really helpful, um, and um, and and to understand better, just like the physical space in which they exist, to see that Ray Comfort has a, you know, has a has a skeleton in his closet, you know, a fake skeleton hanging there, you know, just to see the kind of the kind of playful world that he has made for himself, as opposed to the much more kind of regimented um, world of Biola, and to see these different styles um, behind the camera. Um, that that um, that are at work and and the kind of the kind of infrastructure these people are, are are holding up, you know, it's so you know inextricable from from you know America and in, in in its other in its other facets um, to recognize that this is not you know an exception to the culture in which it exists, but is actually very much a product of that. You know, was was so important. I think some, something that's really interesting that maybe, even though obviously the approach of someone like William Lane Craig is very different from the approach of someone like Ray Comfort, um, something that they share in common is the kind of emphasis that they would put on the kind of assent to maybe particular like propositions about who Jesus was or whatever. Um, and I wonder, because, because you have quite a nuanced take on religion and religious life, like how, how do you view their kind of their projects, you know, do you think that they're like a good thing for religion in general, if they're sort of going, you know, if, if Ray Comfort's going out there having these conversations and they convert people, or if, um, you know, if, 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 even if people get like obsessed with the apologetics industry, as it were, buying all these apologetics books, but if that if that's helping people to assent to those propositions, is that a good thing? Or is this in some way, according to you, um, maybe like in conflict with what it means to have an authentic religious life because it's about something other than you know maybe what what's important to Christianity. I mean, what what are your thoughts? Yeah, well, one of the things that was striking for me was like, you know, going into these spaces as a Christian and feeling, you know, not feeling, not getting a lot of spiritual nourishment from this from this stuff. And and that was a that was a kind of paradox I had to wrestle with a lot. Was you know, in some respects, you know, I I. I um, I, I would, 
connect more with the Sam Harris and, you know, Richard, it was, it was heartbreaking when I interviewed Richard Dawkins, because this was a person who had, had great influence on me as a kid reading his science books. And the fact that I had interviewed William Lane Craig and that I was a Christian, you know, he turned on me in the middle of the interview and said, you know, what side are you on? And I was just like, do you yeah, have sides. to see yeah, the world the way that viewing way? It. Yeah. And, and um, you know, and, and it was a difficult question for me to answer at that point, because, you know, being with William Lane Craig and, and Ray Comfort, these were not people, you know, these were not the kinds of people that had drawn me into the Christian faith, um, you know, and, and the kinds of people who had really cemented my, my presence there, the, the, the you know, the people who, 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 you know, who, who I, who, who became my gurus, you know, are people who are not making big arguments on YouTube. There are people, you know, who are living, living as the poor, who are, who, who are, you know, sharing, you know, tears with, with, with people on the street who, who are, um, you know, who are living deep lives of compassion and, and, you know, having that kind of presence of, of humility uh, that, that, you know, so much a part of Jesus's life. And, you know, this is not something you saw um, among these these figures. Um, and so I you know I learned a lot from them. I think you know Ray Comfort's an interesting figure. you know I, I think he's kind of a, a charlatan or whatever, but you know I, I'm not gonna I'm not gonna condemn him. I you know I, I think he I'm sure he does good for people. And you know ultimately one of the things I've been most grateful about with the in the Catholic Church is its is its complexity, you know, is its it's everything and more. And and what I just deeply detest is when somebody tries to, and so many people try to do this to say, you know, you're only, you know, you can only be a you know a Christian if you look this particular way and you're into this particular style and you like this kind of liturgy. Now, you know, to me, what's powerful about a universal church is that the ambition of claiming, you know, no, we want many different forms, we want many different. Um, cultures, um, many different ways of being um, in this. And so, you know, when I saw someone like William Lane Craig, I, I, I developed a deep affection for him, you know, even though he did not, you know, I, I, I knew he was not ministering to me in the way that I needed, you know, but I saw that he was, you know, a, a, you know, a, a great mentor to the people who were drawn to that sort of thing. And I was grateful that he was there for that. Even if I, you know, many of the choices and 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 approaches he took were not ones that I was tremendously inspired by. So, so that that you know that that was a, you know, always a challenge for me. I was never really comfortable in those apologetic spaces. That apologetic path, you know, is not my charism. Um, but I, you know, but I also came to recognize, you know, I appreciated it, that it is the charism for others, um, and and and. You know, just kind of stood in awe sometimes of the the the, the skill and capacity um, and rigor that 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 people had had found in in following that path. So, so something that you talk about in the book as well is this kind of connection between the apologetics um, and, and the amount of money, I suppose, involved in it and so forth, but also this renaissance of Christian philosophy, as as uh, Craig likes to call it, and. Um, obviously, a lot of this has its root in some particular figures like Alvin Plantinger, and you went to Plantinger's retirement party, and then you went to um, a few conferences for these um, for, the, for these like Christian philosophical organizations. I wonder if you could just speak about how that what I suppose it's slightly different from kind of going to the apologetics places, but it also gave you a different perspective on on proofs and the state of um, contemporary Anglo-American analytic philosophy of religion in Christian circles. Yeah, it, it was really revealing to me again, because I had been told in school, you know, that um, these, you know, kind of um, uh, uh, the kind of the, the particularly Anglophone um, kind of uh, positivist approach to to um, argument, you know, was kind of a dead end. And um, when I went to these conferences, I was struck by just the rigor and creativity of what people were up to. You know, Alvin Plantinga's arguments are really creative. You know, they're 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 beautiful in the way in which they um, take surprising paths. Um, and he's just an interesting thinker. Um, and, you know, and 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 became known as such in, in secular contexts as well. Um, and, and there was a, there were a bunch of people, you know, like that. Um, 
uh, you know, not all of his stature, or his capacity, but, you know, there were interesting questions being raised. And then there were some non-interesting questions, but that's the same, you know, it's like that at any conference. I mean, another thing too, that I really appreciated was the sense of, you know, that I'd been to a lot of academic conferences by that point, but there was also like a kindness and a camar camaraderie in that, in that circle that, um, that, you know, it was really striking to me. And, and um, so I, I just, I, I was just, um, fascinated by by that academic life world, especially because I had been in such a close one. I had been studying philosophy of religion, you know, of a different sort, much more of the continental tradition, uh, much more focused on interpretive uh, approaches rather than than you know rational arguments. And um and 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 so you know I'd been close, but I just had not seen this particular world and you know just thought it was it was you know a fascinating uh, space and and a space of clear vigor and um, and 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 momentum and and, um, and 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 so just seeing that at work was um, remarkable. Also to see the very strategic ways in which that world was being developed. You know, this was not an accident. It was part of an apologetic pro project. There were a number of organizations that had kind of invested themselves in supporting the development of this from you know, the Biola University itself to the John Templeton Foundation and, um, you know, other kind of very intentional, um, very strategic um, choices that went into cultivating um, that, that, that culture that I had seen. And, and, you know, that, that really drew me into the, you know, I became very fascinated with the kind of strategy of intellectual life. Like, you know, how do you build an intellectual movement? Um, and this was something that seemed to me they had accomplished quite successfully um, in layering both popular popular outreach, you know, the YouTube videos, the DVDs, the the you know this whole kind of apologetic program with this like philosophical um, program. And I saw all those levels and saw how they fit together, um, and that was remarkable. I mean, it, you know, the, the the fact that whenever they have an academic conference, they also have a massive popular apologetics thing. You know, I went back to my kind of secular religious study world and said, did you know what, you know, the Christian philosophers are doing? You know, the, whenever they meet for academic papers, they also put on a huge show, um, you know, at a, at a mega church. And people are just like, that is amazing. <laughs> you know, um, that is an incredible piece of like intellectual, um, uh, uh, strategy that you just don't see in other contexts. So, you know, I, I, you know, I really tip my hat to that and still, you know, I'm back in the academic world now. Um, you know, I don't see anything like that, um, in media studies, you know, we don't do that. Um, and, and maybe we should. Right. Um, so I've got a couple more questions and hopefully, um, they'll come in under the, the sort of 10 minutes or so left, um, or, or five minutes or so actually. So, Maybe just this one, if it goes over a little bit. So what role now do you see philosophical reason and proofs as playing in uh, your religious thinking? As the, I suppose as the upshot of finishing the book and then having a few years um, since. It, you know, it's really played in some respects, you know, a, a small role um, in the sense that, you know, I, I, I understand, as I've said, you know, my faith is attached much more to... Uh, you know, a kind of social world, a, a kind of visceral experience, um, uh, uh, you know, experience of, you know, of, of, of poverty and, and commitment and, and grace. Um, at the same time, you know, again, I'm still that person who wrote this book, who wants to understand stuff. And I um, am so grateful for the journey that it took me on. Um, the kind of catalog of of proofs I have in in you know in my head, but also the catalog of human experiences. Because what I saw, looking at the proofs through the lens of history and through the lens of biography of the people producing them, it helped me to recognize that reason is is a part of a bigger picture um, of of a human being. And of, of 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 our social worlds, and that reason is always, you know, enmeshed in those um, in those other experiences. And so, the quest to solve a quest a, a a problem like you know religious faith 
with reason alone, you know, and people have been saying this for thousands of years, so it's not like this is an original thought, right? But that, you know, I had to learn it my own way, right? And that reason alone is not, um, you know, it, it, you know, is kind of is kind of walking on one leg, um, and uh, at the same time, it is, you know, it is an important leg. We need that. We need that that piece, and that when we recognize those arguments as part of a broader picture, um, I think they're all the more beautiful. Um, the 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 we are impoverishing our understanding of our religious inheritance if we look at those arguments simply as abstract reason. When we see them as as being part of a world of faith, um, a world of experience, a world of community, um, they actually become much richer. You know, Anselm's argument, that his famous ontological argument, didn't make any sense to me until I started really focusing on the emotional character of the book in which they appear in his other writings and recognizing the, the way he loved. You know, he was a deeply affectionate person. Um, he was, uh, he, it is an argument that makes more sense when you understand the love that, with which it is written. Um, similarly with, with someone like Aquinas, you know, when you understand what he was really risking in trying to bridge cultures. Those arguments suddenly take on, to me, a more Christian character. You know, um, Christian tradition is always warned against reasoning in the abstract. You know, St. Paul warns against this, you know, um, uh, against, you know, the, the, the Greeks doing their, doing their endless, um, you know, their endless reasonings. Um, but when you see these arguments in the context of, of risk, you know, of, of, um, you know, of of humility, of of love, um, of those of those those fuller human um, you know parts of of, of human life. Um, you know, they they mean all the more. The, the 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 pivots of reason take on you know a new a new power, um, and and that's what I you know I I hope I could communicate with that book is is a, the recognition that we are actually missing something when we are detaching you know reason from all that. And that we gain so much more when we see it both in our lives and in these historical contexts. We we gain so much more when we put um, the the proofs back into the flesh from which they came. I appreciate that, and I, I think that's something that I particularly liked about the book because I've, uh, you know, I so so I I'm an epistemic agnostic myself, uh, but I have a, a deep sympathy for the Christian tradition. But I found that the more and more, you know, that I've sort of read. Um, in philosophy of religion, it's not like I, I feel like I've, you know, I kind of grasped the way that reality fundamentally hangs together any any better as a result of that. And I think, you know, re recognizing the the limits of reason, but how that how um, the way I think about things is interwoven with my experiences as a person and um, all sorts of other things. It, it, you know, that's something that came across in the book, and I liked about it. So the the last question then is just um, in terms of since writing the book, are there any kind of big changes or steps in your thinking since then that you'd want to kind of communicate or wish you could have put back in the book um and also actually i want to know if that monastery um is still around because you kind of talked about how there were the potential that there was the potential of that kind of um you know not existing anymore in the last chapter so um yeah if you, if you could kind of wrap up how, how things have gone since the book yeah well it, it I, I don't know that my my views have changed so much as my my life has changed. Um, you know, I, the, the questions um, animating the book are no longer so central for me. Um, they may become again. Um, one thing that I noticed in, in the book, there's a chart of like the ages at which people made arguments. And, and often what you would see is like, there was one phase in their life of a kind of conversion process. And then like a much later phase where they returned to the questions in a new way. Um, and um, so, you know, much more of my life has turned toward, um, you know, the the kind of worldly questions of politics and power. And, you know, I found myself spending way more, more time than I ever expected, like worrying about financial models and things like that in the online economy, um, trying to work out questions of justice that, you know, are to me deeply and, you know, connected to uh, to faith, but not in the same way of um, of trying to wrestle with you know the basics underpinning it, um, uh, but 
the um you know in in terms of what i've um you know i've learned since is just you know uh, i think something that i was only able to articulate in the book in an intellectual way around the limits of 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 proof you know just have become confirmed for me all the more in 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 life sense that that this this path on its own the the path of reason on its own um, has such profound limits um, yet at the same time is a carrier of um you know of of, of some profound truth um, and and I've just seen those 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 limits. I've seen the the other side. I've given more attention to the other sides of of religious life, and you know benefited from that. Um, still, you know, I would not want to dismiss proofs. You know, when it, whenever somebody says, you know, you uh, let you know forget about all that stuff. It doesn't add up to anything. I want to say no, 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 no. Wait, you you don't recognize that there is something very powerful in that work, in that journey, you know, in that in that challenge. Um, so yeah, in in many respects, it's it's not so much that my views have have changed; it's that my life has changed. Um, I'm a much more boring sort of Christian, you know. I I I I, I go to you know go to church on Sundays. I you know do my thing, um, and and you know teach my kids prayers and. Um, you know, and just don't worry about it in the same way that, that that I did. And I'm grateful for that. I'm grateful for the chance to see this faith from different directions. Um, in terms of the monasteries, um, you know, that particular community is still hobbling along as far as, as, far as I know. Um, but these traditions are really under threat. They're endangered species. And I am deeply... Um, concerned about that. I, I look, gained so much from the contemplative tradition um, uh, uh, in Christianity as well as in other faiths, but particularly that kind of um, Benedictine and, and uh, Cistercian tradition of, of silence, of contemplation. It's something that I think far too many Christians don't get to experience, don't even know is there. And that deeply concerns me. Um, one organization I, I'm really, um, Kind of in love with is called um, nuns and nuns n o n e s and n u n e s. Um, it's um, people who are largely kind of often agnostic or um, you know don't have a deep connection to a religious tradition, but who are you know curious, who are having dialogues with particularly Catholic nuns um, who have these pretty remarkable properties and spaces and resources, and whose traditions are are really dying out. Um, to pass on that the charism and to figure out new models of land stewardship that can that can continue to carry those traditions. Um, I think challenge, you know, work like that is really, really important right now. How do we, in a in a time where the political economy is changing and being a monk and a nun or a nun is not, you know, as attractive an option for many, many people as it was in the 1950s, um, how do we make sure that 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 tradition doesn't get, get lost and that it can, can continue to serve um, people even if they don't, you know, end up devoting their lives to it. Um, my life has been, you know, immeasurably shaped by, for the better by the monastic tradition, um, by, by that, you know, that, that way of life. Um, I, you know, still go to the, you know, the Trappist Monastery and here in Colorado where I live, um, you know, I, I, um, you know, any chance I, I get to, you know, go on it. My, my idea of a vacation is going to a monastery. Um, and, um, you know, and I, I, I just think it's such an important um, path that, you know, we need to find new, new containers for um, uh, it's too precious to lose. So that there were a few questions, but I don't think we're going to have time for them because we've gone over a, a little bit. Um, so thank you everyone for watching. Is there just anywhere that you'd want to direct people to, um, like a best place to get the book from your point of view or where they can find out more about your work? Um, sure. My, you know, my website's nathanschneider.info. Um, and uh, I think there are lots of used copies of God and Proof out there in the world um, on the internet and beyond. I love Better World Books. It's my favorite bookshop, uh, followed by uh, bookshop.org. Um, 
but uh, as well as you know, above all, your local bookstore. Um, asking for it there is you know is the best way to support a you know a vibrant community. Um, you know, and 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 beyond this, you know, my work lately is on like economy and governance in the online economy, totally or in the you know online world. It's 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 a totally different space. Um, but uh, you know, but still those same lessons of of connecting, you know, the the rational and the structural with the with the human, the emotional, the the political, um, you know, are, are 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 still very much there for me. I, I also am a, a regular writer for America Magazine, which is a, a Catholic magazine published by the Jesuit Order. Um, you know, recently did an article about you know rethinking the Lord's Prayer, things like that. Um, so um, so you can also find me there. So, but thank you so much for the opportunity to, you know, to revisit this project, um, something that, you know, that means a lot to me still and, and um, that I hope will be of use to others. Yeah, no problem. I really enjoyed the book. So thanks for writing it. Um, I'll end the stream there.